right before the, the performance started, uh, Pamela Tachi, our artistic director, talked about how you two met in Miami as scholarship students of the Young Arts Foundation. And I'm curious if you can just tell us a bit more about your relationship and how you got from that point to, uh, to performing here at The Pillow with us and, and kind of what that evolution was, how you kept tabs on each other, how you reconnected, and, and what made you want to create work together. When I met Conrad, or I, when I first uh, got to watch Conrad play, was at the Young Arts Foundation, Young Arts Week, uh, that happens every January in Miami. And Conrad came out and introduced his piece. Uh, he was a, a winner in composition, and he said, I've written this uh, for this trio, a suite of pieces that should distill what love feels like. He was 17, I was 17, and I went, oh. <laughs> Give me a break. I did not say should. I said it did. Yeah. Well, oh. <laughs> yeah. He was a confident. See, okay. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And yeah. and and then I liked it, and I was even more angry. I said, "Oh wow, that was beautiful. Damn it." And and then at the end of the show, Conrad had arranged with a twenty-four hour, with twenty-four hour notice, a a full orchestral arrangement of "Whip My Hair" by Willow Smith. Um, which uh, is a really annoying and popular song in 2011. And I said, this guy is just unstoppable and really weird. And uh, so I had my eye on him from then. We, we reconnected to do a gala together in 2013. Conrad wrote a piece called Leaves for piano, cello, and tap dance. And iPad. And iPad. Yeah, electronics. Yeah. Yeah, woo, iPad. <laughs> Branding. Um, and then we actually didn't work together, nor did we become... Uh, deeply close. It, it wasn't. It wasn't in the stars or anything like that. It just. I think sometime in 2016, I invited you to see an early show of my company, and we had a nice talk afterwards, and we started being real life friends. Yeah. You can take it from there. Isn't yeah. It? I mean, it, it. It just. I honestly thank goodness for texting and social media and being able to reconnect um, easily. Uh, in 2016, Caleb asked if I'd be interested in seeing some new work that he was debuting with his company. I think it may have been like early stages of Me Ella or something. Um, but I just grew really curious about what Caleb was doing. And also I loved hearing um, Caleb talk about what he was doing at, because he was working with forms I wasn't uh, fluent in at all and, and just wasn't terribly aware of. And, and the way that Caleb talked about social dance was immediately striking and interesting and, and, and just beautiful to me. And so when I think you reached out maybe sometime in 2017 or so about wanting to do a, a, an evening length work and, and wanting to do original music and live music and, and it just really grew from there. I mean, I, I found like uh, my first notes from our first uh, meetings um, over like, I don't know, Greek takeout. And, and I found like my first iPhone note from like fall 2017. And it's always nice when you look at your notes and I'm not gonna reveal what's in them, but you, you, it's always nice when you look at your notes and you're just like, oh, we actually kind of did that. Yeah, yeah, the, the piece started <laughs> somewhere and definitely ended somewhere else. But the, the things we were trying to accomplish, the things that were in the very first conversations we had about what a piece together might look like and, and what we might hope to express that is unique to our, to our collaboration, to our relationship. A lot of those things were accomplished. I, I too found early notes recently, mm -hmm. but I too will not reveal them. Uh, uh, we, we won't be because coy. Because we're shady yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so once you decided to work together, once you had those conversations and you kind of had a sense of the way that you wanted to approach it, um, you kind of had a unique given your scheduling and, and the challenges of that, you kind of had to put it together in these quick bursts. You had, I think, three or four residencies, one of which was here at The Pillow last February. And I'm curious if you can talk about the way that you approached those opportunities, having such concentrated times, spaced far out. How did you use them? Like, what did you, what questions did you go in with? And, and um, especially here at The Pillow, because that's what we're interested in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what did that mean to you, that residency? Finding, finding space to rehearse in New York City for a dance artist is very difficult. You can double the difficulty of that if you are working in percussive dance, anything that makes noise for the downstairs neighbors. 
um, or damages the floor. And then you can triple that if you just say, oh, is it cool if we pour sand all over the floor? So essentially, working on this in a dance studio the way that most New York dance companies work in a dance studio was, was impossible. So we, we really built this whole piece, this whole hour, in three three and a half tech residencies, where we essentially got into a space, built our floor, said, whoops, we had to build it differently, and then built it again. Every and then time, right? Every time, every time, yeah, something happens. We yeah. really have figured it out for the most part. But um, yeah, as you can imagine with a piece that has such a specific um, uh, set of ingredients, not to mention uh, Conrad's schedule and the dancer's schedule and my own schedule, it, it really was created quite quickly. I think in total we, we maybe had nine full working days before a premiere or something like that. That um, being said, though, it was across like a year. Yeah, it was across much. a year. And in between, Conrad and I were constantly in discussion. Yeah. We, we still wanted to make a lot of it in the room because I think uh, best, you know, you can have a great uh, long distance phone call, but there's nothing like being in the same room as the person, especially when you're talking about uh, physical forms like music and dance. Um, it, it, it really requires in-person in-person conversation, but we, we talked a lot, we sent a lot of thoughts back and forth, and, and the conversation, even though we only spent nine days making this piece on its feet, we spent a whole year talking about yeah. those nine days. Mm -hmm. I thought it was, uh, I mean, it, uh, not, it, not to suggest some sort of predestination or anything like that, but, but um, it ended up feeling like a really beautiful way of creating because we make together, I'd be in the room for our full days, the full week. Um, I mean, f for example, at the Pillow Lab, which was our first residency, um, we came here really just like with the vaguest of ideas and some sketches that I had done beforehand. Um, and it was really liberating to create without at that point, I don't even think we had a premiere date set or anything. It was just completely an opportunity to make something and without a product in mind, which was really amazing, actually. It was really, really special. We had goals and we had like blue sky thinking, but, it, but when it came to the making of the thing, it wasn't like, oh, how do we m make this fit into a sellable, like APAP friendly format or whatever. <laughs> it's like, it's actually, yeah. let's just do stuff and figure out what it is later. And, and so we ended up creating in these like really concentrated bursts, but having a lot of time to reflect on it and and talk about it and live with it and then we go back and it would be again these crazy few days and then you sit for a few months again it was actually really great yeah and they were also such intense periods and it and it felt like this is going to sound uh, like cheesy or something but like the the soul of the piece was baked at the same time as the piece it's not like we constructed the house and then said but you know uh, how are we supposed to live in it we when we were at, at the Pillow Lab, it was, it was February in the Berkshires, and those of you who know what February in the Berkshires is like, we were, we were really the only, only people out here. We were staying in the house down the street. We got stuck in the snow multiple times, and we were in this, studio, uh, or in this theater for you know, eight hours for a few days. And, but what that means is that we had a lot of time to talk mm -hmm. in the room and outside the room, and, it, and it, it's sort of like they say you should like talk to your plants or like sing to your brownies or something as you as you make them but like it it sort of feels like within within the the structure and the content of the work is is all of the conversations we are having which is why in many ways this work feels so deeply personal for all of us who are in it um, because we are all involved in in the making of it and we are also involved in the sort of um, the, the, the social structure of making it as well. We were, we, were, we were really opening up at the same time. Yeah, and also like it was uh, because these are musical dance forms that Caleb is working with and that everyone here is um, you know, diversely great at. Um, it was writing music with musicians. So it was writing music with dancers, not for dancers. I'm curious what you learned from each other in the process. I mean, you're both artists working in different mediums and uh, approaching your creation in different ways. And is there something about the way that Conrad was composing music or the way that Caleb was composing movement um, that kind of inspired your own creations? Conrad is really good. Um, and it's, it's really lovely to, um, to hear him talk about why he's written what he's written. Not, you know, it's not like he... He, he writes something and I ask a question and he goes, I don't know, you know, it's just, it's just what I wrote. And, and I'm not, I'm not uh, belittling intuition 
or 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 uh, artists that create from their gut, but but Conrad has a way of also articulating what what he's working, and he'll talk about how the structure supports um, emotional momentum in a piece. We'll talk about harmonic changes and, and rhythmic changes and 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 other sound worlds that 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 seem to to meet a, a goal or an idea or a feeling. Um, uh, I think in that way we were speaking the same language. In, in the way that we were very different, uh, I primarily have worked in, in jazz idioms. Um, these, are, these are jazz dance forms. And so I've, I've worked with a lot of musicians who were talking about AABA or ABAC or, or 16 bars or why don't we trade or, or you know, diff different ways of, of talking about jazz from a structural and melodic and harmonic and, and rhythmic sensibility. And Conrad really, that's that's not his practice, and so I think it was it was exciting for me to learn from Conrad's Conrad's experience and and what lives in his body and what lives in his his current kind of artistic practice. But it also was exciting for me because I didn't feel like we were gonna we were having a very fresh conversation. It was not it was unlike any conversation I'd ever had with a composer. I mean, and and uh, I'm and I'm gonna say that I feel like I learned a lot about my intuition <laughs> through this process, actually. Um, I, but I, that that may have more to do with the conditions of, of of how we made this piece. But I, for me, as a pianist, first of all, I found working with these dancers, this group of people, and and this particular format of like um, feet on sand on wood, uh, really made me think about. Uh, my playing in a different way. It gave me like a new dimension with which to think about my playing. It, 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 this is a, uh, a, a format in which like release is very audible and felt. And I became really interested in my keyboard playing uh, about how something like a phrase or, or wh whatever it is we mean when we say the word phrase, um, melody or some other kind of gestural element or something, um, what if you could feel that with release? What if you could feel that through um, taking, taking things away? What if that also is an articulation of some sort instead of it just being like an articulation in the form of, and now I say my thing. What if the articulation is a strategic like release or something like that, you know? So that is really useful as a pianist. It opens up the notion of the piano because most people think about the piano, I think, not inaccurately as like you hit a thing and it makes a sound, <laughs> which is not unlike some of the early conversations we had about this piece were about uh, maybe moving out of exclusively a notion of percussive dance that's like single percussive, like plosive yeah, yeah. sounds. Percussive dance is called percussive dance, but percussive dance can also be melodic mm -hmm. or lyrical. Can we can we talk more about the sand and kind of what um, what that meant to make the decision not only to use it but as as you've talked about before that it's been used before oftentimes in very kind of small concentrated ways but the decision to spread it around the entire stage to be something that um, was part of every sound that came from there after, that it, it was something that once it was down, you could no longer escape and became so integral to the work. You know, what was that like for you to, you know, to, to decide to make, um, to make that choice? Um, also, just from a physical perspective, watching you all dance on it was remarkable and literally breathtaking. I mean, you looked like you were ice skating, you know, at times. Um, and then Conrad, for you, um, the way that that was a new sound to, to respond to. It was great fun. I mean, it's a beautiful sound, first of all. Like, it's, I think it's a beautiful sound, and, and, and I've been told, I don't really get to spend a lot of time in the floor, as y'all saw, but it, I've been told that it feels fantastic. Yeah, to be in. Jabu said today, I love dancing on sand. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think, yeah, I, I really like the sound of sand. I, I hope no one in the audience is that, like, 0.1% of the population that, like, like hates the sounds, like like nails on a chalkboard. Um, but I also find it to be a very 
a, a, a very abstract sounds and that I, I people come to us all the time and say it sounds like a it sounds uh, like in in the opening and closing moments it sounds like a campfire it sounds like sounds like a wood burning and cracking and people will say it sounds like someone tearing open a, a like a bag really sl or like ripping paper really slowly or it sounds like someone just like like digging their hands, or I don't know. It it it's, it seems to be so evocative. Um, for us to dance on it, it really changes the way that you think about your dancing. It's a it's a relatively delicate sound compared to what metal tap shoes on wood provides. Um, you don't have the kind of power, but you do have a certain sort of lyricism that's available. Um, it's imagine if imagine a piano with no sustain pedal, um, uh, and that's that's what tap dance can often feel like. And then imagine the piano with a sustained pedal, and that's what that's what sand allows. And I can play the longest note in the world by just going. When usually that takes you know twenty to thirty notes to to just bathe the room with that kind of sound. And and then finally, yeah, it it does get quite slick, but in an enjoyable way. It does change the way that you negotiate your weight in space. It does change the way you think about sliding. Uh, tap dancers love sliding. But sliding on sands in leather soled shoes is a whole nother, whole nother world. Um, I don't know. It's just like it's it's a whole nother discipline. Um, and and every time we do the show, I feel like I learn something new about dancing in sand. You, you use the you sort of describe the um, dispersing of sand as like creating. You can't escape. And I was I was interested in that. I. I don't think that's actually, like, we, the box is not something that we want to escape, per se. I, I think, actually, something, an aspect of the sand that we grew to really like over the course of the year that we spent making this piece um, is this, a, is that it's abundant. Yeah, there's a lot of there's it. There's a lot of it, and. And it doesn't belong to anyone, yeah. and you don't have to keep track of it. Um, at, no, but it, in a, it's 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 very philosophical in the sense that you 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 have to let go of something to get something. Yes. You you can't hold the sand in your hands. I mean, actually, I think the the duet that Nathan and Evita do is is the greatest indicator of this idea that in order to connect, you have to you have to let go of what what you're holding on to. Um, not to put not to put ideas in your head, but it's too late. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we all do that. We all, every, every person who walks on stage in this show, the first thing they have to do is let go of whatever they're holding on to. Yeah. And, uh, Into and the it, shared space. And what you get from it is what we get from it as well. We have to sort of let go before we can, before we can express anything or before we can contribute anything to, yeah. to the shared world that we live in. It's not like this is, this is Brittany's corner and that's, that's Jabu's corner and that's Naomi's corner. It, it you know, it's, yeah. it, no one's Long, hoarding. No one's hoarding sand. It's uh, there's no there's no scarcity. Yeah, there's just space for all. 